Alright all you glorious gamers out there, welcome to the Players 2 podcast, the video game podcast for gamers like you, by gamers like you. You can find Players 2 on all the social media, that's Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, the lot. You can also find our written content over at players2.com, that's P-L-A-Y-E-R-S-T-O-O.com. And if you could take five seconds to give us five stars anywhere you get your podcast, whether that's Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Podchaser, wherever... It all helps us out. It does a huge amount for the exposure of the show. And thank you so much to anyone that's already done that for us. If you leave us a review as well, let us know on social media and we'll give you a little shout out. All right, and on with the show. My name is Mark Henderson. And for the first time ever, Lewis is not with me as always. He is in his own flat in a small cupboard. How's it going, Lewis? <laughs> I am indeed in a small cupboard. Uh, yeah, we are fully in lockdown here in the UK now um, because of coronavirus, so um, I can't leave and we can't do this as we normally would round in, in Mark's flat, so I have set up shop in what is an extremely cramped uh, cupboard in my flat. And yeah, so I'm recording from here. Otherwise, I'm doing pretty well, Mark. How are you? <laughs> yeah, I mean, apart from the lockdown that is affecting everyone and been a huge hindrance to everyone's lives. I'm doing okay, pretty, pretty fine, <laughs> apart from apart from that terrible, just, just terrible all of disaster that. yeah. that's happening to everyone. <laughs> apart from all of the horror. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Jesus. Yeah. Anyway, on your video games list, what have you been playing? Well, Mark, um, I have finally rolled credits on Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order, which has taken me a fair bit of time to get through. But um, now that I'm finally through with it, I can say that I really enjoyed that game. I, I, I think it had a lot of flaws, which I've spoken about you know, at length in previous shows. But I just I want to focus on the good stuff here. I thought it was a really, really good Star Wars story. Totally agree with that. Totally agree with yeah, that point. Yeah, I mean, it, it has some surprises in it. It doesn't try to do anything overly complex, but it takes you to some interesting places. It introduces some really good characters. Not so, not so much Cal Kestis, ironically enough, the character that you play as, but a lot of the people around him and his squad and the people that you meet along the way are really interesting. I think it sets up for a sequel really well and leaves things in a really interesting place with the characters that are still around you. Some of the, the late gameplay stuff, it's essentially like a series of boss battles towards the end in a sort of like final attack type thing and I just I thought all of that pulled everything together really well all the all the skills that you'd learn throughout the game all of the different puzzle solving elements and stuff that you'd had to do all of the boss battles that you'd had to learn different techniques from culminated in this fairly quick you know I think last week I was almost at the end and I basically just had a couple of boss fights and like one last level to do all of that was just like a joy to play through in comparison to what a lot of the other game had been and it made me think a lot about control again actually and how they are two games which for a lot of people were games of the year last year but for me at least both of them had really significant technical problems and and both of them have at their core like really good ideas about what they're trying to do as video games but need sort of more time and a bit more love put into them maybe and I just I think the sequel for both of those games like Control 2 whenever it comes and Jedi Fallen Order 2 which I'm, I'm pretty certain has already been confirmed to be worked on right I think EA have more or less yeah, told us that yeah well it's at least been leaked yes, yeah the, the I mean, it would be, be a sequel to Fallen Order it would be stunning I if, mean of course there will of course yeah it would be really remarkable if there wasn't and so bo- I think both of those games for their future like they are probably major franchises for the next generation both of them being really solid kind of entry points but i just think jedi fallen order was a really fun not a perfect game by any stretch but a really really fun game to play from start to finish even though it had its problems it never kind of became too frustrating to get through and when i left it i was like this is good i'm, I'm kind of done with that and can move on from it so and beyond that um now that we are in lockdown i've been getting back into gaming with my flatmate and what we were playing before ages and ages ago as some of you might remember was outer wilds which is just this utterly incredible indie kind of space exploration game you've probably heard me speak about it before kind of been playing it on and off for for months now i mean literally about six months now i think but i just wanted to say i won't go that on and on about the games it. that you simply could not complete <laughs> yeah i mean it it is difficult to complete. There's just puzzles that I'm still not sure how we're going to solve them. But I just want to say really quickly, I won't go on and on about that game in particular. But in terms of it being a good game for this current moment, it, fo- it forces you to explore and to think and to learn and put your learning into action and try things and not worry about failure because there's always another time loop and you always get another chance to go and try things again. And I've been quite put off from playing quite stressy games just now just because of the atmosphere around us. And I just think Outer Wilds is one of many games and I'm sure a lot of websites and a lot of other podcasts and everything will be talking about games to play just now and games to avoid, which is also probably important. But I just want to throw my hat in the ring for Outer Wilds to say if it's 
ever been of interest to you and if you are a bit stressed out just now it is the perfect game to keep your mind occupied there's no combat there's only kind of limited peril and so there's not that much to worry about in it but it's so satisfying and every time you get another secret unlocked or you work out another part of the puzzle it is a really joyous experience so I would sing the praises of Outer Wilds to the rafters definitely and then finally the last thing that I was playing uh, was a very quick run through of the Resident Evil 3 remake demo um, which was just earlier today actually um, and you've played it as well Mark right? I have indeed I have indeed my playthrough took maybe about uh, how long did I say it took about 28 minutes yeah just shy of 30 minutes yeah yeah I did get definitely lost at one stage largely because I kind of in my own head forgot that I had a map <laughs> but uh, yeah which is which is obviously ludicrous but yeah so my playthrough took maybe slightly longer than yours but man it just got me so in the mood for that game again it just was totally reminiscent of the RE2 remake that engine looks absolutely superb the RE engine is tremendous really really enjoyed it i mean i'd be interested to know what you thought of it really enjoyed it as well um definitely it's the comparison back to resident evil 2 remake is so apt i mean it just felt like the same game to me in a lot of senses it could easily just be dlc for that first game Ab- absolutely it totally just feels like an extension of it rather than a sequel it is it was super it was just really great in the same way that that was great the zombies as well that when you shoot them in the head they don't die kind of goes against what we've been taught as gamers <laughs> for such a long period yeah. of time but they they do feel quite threatening mm-hmm. a lot of the time when sometimes other zombie characters particularly when they're moving quite slowly don't feel and i just think that there's a great atmosphere just created around these games particularly re2 but this game as well just so much hitting all those notes again really great thoroughly enjoyed it got me really buzzing for the new game which i suppose is what the demo was supposed to do well exactly so, yeah. that yeah <laughs> i would say just on that as well like the the thing that really interested me about the demo for this was that like you say, like the, the zombies didn't feel particularly easy. I didn't actually fire a lot because I was getting kind of stressed out about um, missing my shots and using up ammo. And obviously I wasn't sure how well stocked the demo would be with health or ammo. I, I, I was bitten several times. It was I, plentiful, yeah, by the way. I suspect plentiful. that, the, I suspect that the, um, the damage was dialed down in the demo because I, I probably got bit five times and only had to use... Oh, really? Yeah, I only had to use a herb once and you know and managed to get through it all. I definitely had to use a herb once, but yeah. that was largely just him on stupidity <laughs> but yeah I, I never i never got bit that much I, like but i was it, shooting a lot of stuff yeah so. I, I basically wasn't shooting too much and what i was doing though was using the new roll maneuver like the kind of perfect dodge almost oh yeah yeah um, yeah, yeah which i re- that was great by the way i, that, I think that, it's a that, really a, good a really strong addition to the game like and it just what you're able to do when you're confronted with a lot of zombies to roll back to what you were saying about how threatening they feel i was quite nervous that in this game because it's outdoors and it's in the cityscape that the, you would lose that claustrophobia that Resident Evil 2 remake had which was a really big part of the atmosphere and how terrifying that felt and actually I felt like even though this was in a much more open environment they were shuffling towards me quickly you know they weren't just walking in a straight line or in an easily identifiable lane to shoot down you know they were moving around me and I often felt that I was being quite quickly pushed into spaces I didn't want to be in and then having to think about my own positioning quite a lot I was nervous that it wasn't going to have any of that feeling and it absolutely does so I'm totally buzzing for it as well nice one man yeah totally agree I think that looks absolutely superb and the sooner that game gets here the better although it is about a zombie apocalypse and in our current climate (laughs) that's maybe not ideal but in general it is superb it is superb the the other games that I have been playing is well one I finally finally got my chance to play uh, Call of Duty Warzone which is which is really good actually i really liked it i'm not massively into battle royale games although i did get into apex legends a little bit but i did like call of duty quite a lot back in the day i find that it always takes me a bit of time to get used to these battle royales and what exactly you're supposed to be doing and i think that similar to apex the fact that call of duty puts you in teams of three kind of lets the other players carry you when you're not very familiar with your surroundings and what you're supposed to be doing so i had a guy on a mic that was basically telling me exactly what to do moment by moment and basically i just followed this man around and we, we did really really well and this was only my second time playing at all and we finished fourth i think nice. Which was, which was, inc- I mean, there was someone on my team who very, very much knew what they were doing. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, got a, got a few kills, was feeling pretty good, got a few games in. But then I died a couple of times as well, obviously, which meant that I was thrown into the Gulag, which is their little 1v1 match that if you win your match, then you get redeployed automatically and you don't have to wait for your teammates to save you. What a superb addition that is. Yeah. 
It's really, really good. It's a tiny, tiny little map. You're basically given a handgun and all you have to do is shoot the opponent twice or I think if you get a headshot then it's just over. Mm -hmm. But that, that's all you have to do in, in this tiny, tiny little confined space. It's just about almost getting lucky but just being very quick on the draw and being well positioned effectively. It was great. It was really tense but really fun at the same time. So I played five matches and I won three out of the five gulags, which I was pretty pleased about, considering I've not played Call of Duty Modern Warfare at all and not played Call of Duty in quite a long period of time. So I was pretty pleased about that. If you're stuck inside on a quarantine, there are definitely worse games that you could play for free, to be totally honest yeah. with you. So yeah, go and check it out. And the final game that I've been playing, I got to play a bit of Doom Eternal Lewis. Good heavens. Oh, yeah. Good heavens. It is really, really good. What I will say is that so far, and I've not played a huge amount of it, so I'll report back next week. But right now, it's feeling very similar, very similar to Doom 2016. Would you have liked to have seen a bit more progress in that time? Perhaps. But man, it's still so fucking good. It is so <laughs> fun. It really, really is. I love that any obstacle that they put in your way, the answer is never retreat. The answer is always keep fighting, keep fighting, keep fighting, keep fighting. It's all action all of the time. I've never played a shooter like that at all. There's no... I'm not going to say it's not tactical because that would be completely wrong. It is actually quite tactical. But the tactic is never hide. I've never come into a situation ever in Doom 2016 or in the short time that I played Doom Eternal where the response to any situation is run away from the enemy and hide. It's always shoot it in the face faster. <laughs> it's always the response. And yeah. it's just... It's great. It's so refreshing. It's so fun to play. And do you know what? Again, in times like these where we're locked in, shooting a bunch of mindless demons in the face is real satisfying, man. I'm not going to lie to you. It's real, real satisfying. I'm really enjoying it. I can't speak too much about the story or anything like that just now. As I said with Doom 2016, that is not why I'm here for this game at all. But in the short time that I've played it, from a gameplay perspective, it's absolutely superb. It, it just is. It really is the absolute gold standard for FPSs as far as I'm concerned. It is brilliant. Wow. That's, that's high praise. I mean, there's a lot of good FPSs out there, so to call it the gold standard. I think these days it really is, man. I, the, the gunplay, the movement, the pace with which the action is happening, I've never experienced anything like it in an FPS. It's just go, 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 go all the time, and it's, it's great. It's really great fun. It's quite tense at times, but see when you've cleared an area, the sense of satisfaction is brilliant, but then you're immediately onto the next area and then very tense and then great satisfaction. So, so you're always getting that dopamine hit. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> it feels like you're always getting that reward. It's brilliant. I absolutely love it. I would recommend that anyone, anyone go and play Doom Eternal if they can. Great stuff. All right, ladies and gentlemen, and with that, on to the news. All right, and news item number one. Final Fantasy VII Remake may not be able to meet demand because of the coronavirus. In a series of tweets on the Final Fantasy VII Twitter account, Square Enix said this. Due to the extraordinary circumstances the world is facing with the COVID-19 pandemic, we want to update you on how this will impact the forthcoming release of Final Fantasy VII Remake. Our priority is the well-being and safety of our fans and customers, taking into account regional government and World Health Organization advice. The worldwide release of Final Fantasy VII Remake on April 10th will go ahead. However, with the unforeseeable changes in the distribution and retail landscape, which varies across countries, it is increasingly likely that some of you will not get hold of your copy of the game on the release date. We are monitoring the situation on a daily basis and working with our partners, retailers and Square Enix teams across Europe and the Americas to do everything we can to ensure as many of you as possible can play the game on April the 10th. We want to keep you updated ahead of the release and intend to post again this Friday, March 20th, with any further news, so please stay tuned to our official channels. For any other questions regarding the release, please contact our Square Enix store customer services teams for your relevant retailer for information on availability in your region. And then they went on to say on Friday the 20th, As you may have seen, earlier this week we shared the news that the COVID-19 pandemic is increasingly likely to affect the distribution and retail landscape in Europe, Australia and the Americas at launch on April 10th. Thanks for all your comments in response to the message we posted about this. We are sharing all your questions and comments with the relevant teams in these regions so that we can update you further next week. Again, the release of Final Fantasy VII Remake will still go ahead on April 10th. Thanks for your patience, and most importantly, please, everyone, stay safe. Also this week, 
Minecraft Dungeons, uh, their Twitter account also said that because they are working from home now, that their workflow quotes has been disrupted, which, I mean, fair enough, I'm working from home now and my workflow has been disrupted, so I can <laughs> completely believe that. <laughs> and while they are trying to hit their April release window, there's no hard date yet for Minecraft Dungeons, uh, but they will be reevaluating that timeline as they go as well. So that's two games, basically, that were due out for release next month, whose distribution, at the very least, has been impacted by the coronavirus and in reality this is almost certainly going to be the start and far from the end of games getting pushed because of coronavirus absolutely yeah i mean this like you say this is the first time it's certainly not going to be the last um it's good that final fantasy 7 is still going to hit its actual release date like they were at extreme pains to point that out so that no one yeah this was not this a, delay. a delay this yeah. was not a delay the- obviously trying to avoid that kind of messaging altogether. Basically what it means is that for a lot of people, you're going to have to buy it digitally. I wonder, I'm not sure if they've said anything specifically about people who have done physical pre-orders and if they can easily get them switched over. Um, But yeah, they're absolutely going to be pushing the message that digital is the most straightforward way to get a hold of this game on release day because they just absolutely can't guarantee you different markets can deliver the same way there's not going to be a way to do that at all right now i i wonder that moving forward as we see other games potentially get delayed and i'm thinking of ghost of tsushima and the last of us part two are prime candidates i think for delays because of coronavirus yeah i think that the game's coming later in the year so the Avengers and Cyberpunk, we might be through the worst of it by then, so maybe they won't be quite as affected, but I think that Ghost of Tsushima and The Last of Us Part Two might be squarely in the crosshairs. So I wonder if those games don't get delayed, then maybe they opt for a digital release first and then let the retail physical copies catch up. I, I don't really know what the what the strategy would be there from those sort of games, but it's, it's interesting to think about this, that digital might be the way to go, you know? Yeah, it'll definitely push a lot of customers towards buying digitally and, you know, even for the physical diehards, you know, and I, I pretty much count myself there. I tend to buy games physically still rather I, than I digitally. I tend to buy yeah. games, yeah, yeah, physically as well. But it's obviously, you know, f- for instance, I think you're probably right about The Last of Us more so than Ghost of Tsushima. Even The Last of Us looks like, certainly in the UK, it's going to be released more or less right at the peak of the the curve, as they keep referring to. And so the likelihood that a game store and you know, in your local city centre or town centre is going to be open is pretty low and the idea that delivery services are going to get it to you on the day of release is pretty low so if you don't care about that stuff then physical orders are probably still going to be okay but if it really matters to you to be playing it on the day of release I think you're you're almost certainly going to have to go digitally until we're over the worst of all of this. Yeah, I couldn't agree more to be completely honest with you and at this stage because of how this is going to affect manufacture, I think that the next gen consoles, I struggle to believe that they will not be affected by this as well. Although pressing a whole bunch of discs, I don't think that would be quite as onerous as the physical manufacturer and all the components with which are going into a new console. So I wouldn't be surprised if we see them get pushed a little as well. Maybe not into 2021, but maybe closer to Christmas than they would like. Yeah, I th- I think you're probably totally bang on with that as well. The only only thing being that they might still go ahead with the same release date that they were trying to hit, and uh, and just there'll be scarce availability. Yeah, they'll just be you know. scarcity. Yeah, exactly. So that was basically what happened with the Wii. Yeah, is that they weren't expecting the influx of sales that they got for the Wii, which absolutely took off at launch, if anyone remembers. But we could be looking at a similar situation for the PS5 and the Xbox Series X where the the units will just be scarce simply because they haven't had the time to manufacture enough of them depending on how the, the virus progresses. I know that things are looking a bit better in China these days yeah. where much of this manufacturing would be taking place but nonetheless the distribution of those units even if they do get made will be majorly hampered by the virus. Yeah. And speaking of the coronavirus, Lewis, as well, uh, news item number two, it's all doom and gloom here. (laughs) It looks as if PlayStation are going to be slowing down downloads in Europe uh, in order to use less data. This is in order to help ISPs and to alleviate some of the demand for broadband, which has skyrocketed in recent weeks across Europe, because many, many countries in Europe are now in lockdown. President and CEO of PlayStation, Jim Ryan, over on the PlayStation blog, made this statement. 
Playing video games enables players all over the world to connect with friends and family and enjoy much needed entertainment during these uncertain times. Sony Interactive Entertainment is working with internet service providers in Europe to manage download traffic to help preserve access for the entire internet community. We believe it is important to do our part to address internet stability concerns as an unprecedented number of people are practicing social distancing and are becoming more reliant on internet access. Players may experience somewhat slower or delayed game downloads, but will still enjoy robust gameplay. We appreciate the support and understanding from our community and they're doing their part as we take these measures in an effort to preserve access for everyone. So this follows similar moves by Netflix, by Amazon Prime, by Apple, by Facebook, by YouTube, all of whom are reducing their streaming quality in order to alleviate some of the demand on internet providers, just reducing that data that's coming in basically. And I mean, what what do you say? These are hard times Fair dues to PlayStation, as far as I'm concerned. I wouldn't be surprised if we now see Xbox come out and do something similar. Yeah, Xbox have made a statement up, sort of pointing out how they are monitoring the essentially how well Xbox Live is, is doing and when the peaks and the troughs are in their service. So I think that they are they're effectively doing the same thing. I think they probably just haven't announced it in specific at the moment. Um, but yeah, Sony they're doing what they have to do there's no two ways around this basically yeah no definitely i think this i, I mean i mean i think that this is a an honorable decision do you know what i mean I, they, they didn't have to do this but they are doing this in order to help everyone continue to have um internet access sustainable internet access during very trying times ultimately it means that your games might down not download as quickly as they otherwise would have but it sounds as though when you're actually playing online that might not be as affected so I sincerely hope that you have downloaded Call of Duty Warzone before now because that is 100 gigabytes <laughs> and that will likely take an absolute age. Yeah. Well, as we were just saying about Final Fantasy, though, it does mean if you're going to buy that digitally instead of physically... You yeah, also, of course. Yeah, you I never might, put that together. Yeah, Absolutely. You might want to like, preload it and you know let it download overnight or whatever. You're, not, you're almost certainly not going to get a super quick download of it either. So just all stuff to bear in mind. But I mean, there are bigger, bigger issues for all of us right now than download time. So, you know, keep it in perspective gamers all right news item number three half-life alex lewis moving on from the coronavirus forgetting that for a while this isn't the coronavirus show we are about <laughs> video games half-life alex has released and by all accounts is basically set the new benchmark for vr games it has absolutely smashed it the current metacritic score of 92 is very very impressive including 10s from ign vg247 vgc and joe shockers when I see videos of this game, I think that it looks absolutely astonishing. To the point, I said last time when we <laughs> saw gameplay trailers, I think they released three gameplay yeah. trailers in, in one day, I was looking into buying VR headsets, which is something I'd never considered before in my life, which means that what Valve is doing with Half-Life Alex and trying to get people involved more in VR is definitely working because I am seriously considering it because <laughs> the game looks absolutely absolutely amazing i think that the way that you can interact with the world and how objects respond to you and the fact that you can basically pick up and touch and move everything that isn't nailed down is just absolutely amazing it's, it's so dynamic and it's exactly what you picture in your mind's eye when you think about vr and how you can interact with the world it's the first time that i've sort of realized in such an amazing way that 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 speaks to me as like a true vr experience and i really think that valve has just showed here how good a VR game can be. Couldn't disagree with any of that, Mark. I mean, as you've said, like neither of us are VR gamers at the moment. I've only kind of dabbled very briefly with any VR game at all. And generally speaking, yeah, it's not something that I'm interested in. Nor, to be totally honest, has Half-Life been up to this point. It's always been this kind of, you know, elephant in the distance that I've never quite got near, never played it, never bothered trying to, you know, download it. Although recently when they Steam were putting them out for free, I did think quite seriously about getting back into it. Yeah, the, I must admit, the it was one of these games that felt very much like a pc game when yeah. we were growing up and that was a pc game over there and we were over here with our console games and that was that you know what i mean absolutely so, so that, unfortunately yeah. neither of us have have you played it at all I've no, not played no it never at i all. mean so the only my only interaction with the kind of universe of half-life was the two portal games basically oh, of course yeah which you know i would love to see them do more with that as well but this is it seems like yeah a, a benchmark for vr as you said i think the point as well that you made there, i hadn't really thought about it like that but what we have seen of it and i've kind of avoided quite 
quite a lot of the review coverage so far, but we'll dive into it because I'm not likely to play it, or not likely to play it anytime soon at least. But the, those videos, the way that you can interact with the world and the systems that that then opens up for people, I think that that is so close to being that vision of what, you know, it's what you imagine when you're a kid, what VR will be like. It's not limited in any way. You can interact with things as you would as if you were really there. So really, really impressive stuff from uh, Valve to have made this. And yeah, what an introduction or reintroduction to the Half-Life universe for, for gamers now. Like, was it like 10 plus years since the last game? So Yeah, did- it was 2004, I believe, was Half-Life 2. So yeah, God, 16 so, years. Yeah, ages, right? yeah. Almost right now, it does seem as if Half-Life Alex and what Valve are doing there are just so far ahead of the pack. Now, now granted, I'm not as up to speed with VR titles as I am with other aspects of gaming, but to me, in my mind, they are so far ahead of the curve. But what I'm also thinking about is that's all very well and good, but does it really matter if no one's massively interested in playing VR games? And is this good for the series? of Half-Life, this mythical, untouchable, godly <laughs> video game series, you know, that the that this new installment is a half installment and using hardware that isn't readily available to many of us and will never be available to many of us just due to the price of entry. Mm. And as such, a lot of fans of the game will never interact with it and will never experience this experience and will never know this part of the, the Half-Life story, you know. So, I don't know, I still think, for me, VR was just an odd decision. It still, to me, feels like a tool to sell their index headsets. <laughs> you but cynic. It, I, 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 <laughs> like, that might be totally cynical. That might be totally, totally cynical. But regardless of that, and whether or not this game was basically created to sell index headsets, they have made a hell of a game. Yeah. Because I'm seriously considering buying an index <laughs> headset. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, I, I think that's the perfect illustration. Yes, there, there will be, yeah, there, there are bound to be a lot of gamers out there and half life fans even who can't or won't interact with this because it's on VR. And that's just the way it goes. And that's the decision Valve made. They, I, I, I was being kind of facetious there. Like, I do definitely think this is about selling the index. There's no two ways about it. Valve are trying to move the industry much closer towards their vision of how good VR can be and and fair enough like they've achieved that with this game and I think yeah I mean I must admit if you're trying to sell that headset one of the best ways that you can sell that headset is to show off exactly what it can do and how good VR games can be yeah and if and if you're creating the best VR game ever which this very possibly might be in order to sell your headset Kind of fair enough. Yeah, <laughs> Do you well, know what I mean, I don't totally begrudge you that. There's, I don't begrudge you that at all. There's not a worse strategy than that at all. And I think where Half Life itself comes into play there is like if this was a 92 rated game, but wasn't Half Life, I'm not sure we would even be talking about it right now. You know, it's it, no, it has that appeal that it will draw in gamers from all sorts of spheres who want to know, even just for us who haven't played the previous ones and might not play this one even, but we are were interested in the score we wanted to know plenty of other people out there will have wanted to know did they achieve this what are people saying about this and if this came out and it was like a seven and people were saying this not a great return to the to the half-life universe then maybe it would have been a total disaster but they've nailed it they've made another solid entry in that series they've brought people even like yourself looking searching for deals on uh on headsets it's, it's, oh you know, man there's none to be had mate I can tell you <laughs> well, that right now cer- certainly not right now eh? <laughs> but yeah it's, it's all it's all to the good for them in terms of getting people into that ecosystem so absolutely fair play to them I can't wait to read a bit more about it watch some videos of it because like you say very unlikely to play it anytime soon but um, yeah a, a fantastic achievement and well done basically I'll put a video in the show notes over at players2.com of Dan Stapleton's review for IGN which goes into like a bunch of the details but see just watching the gameplay yeah man it's it's fascinating absolutely fascinating i, th- I think what valve have done is a, a real genuine achievement with that game all right finishing off as we always do with a couple of shout outs first up persona 5 royal reviews are in currently sitting at an astonishingly high 95 on metacritic for the playstation 4 so if you thought half-life alex was good <laughs> Deary me, deary me. So this reviewed really well. The original game reviewed really well. This is basically an updated version of the original Persona 5 game. Apparently it has up to 20 hours more content, although I'm not sure how much of that is 
necessary content because it seems as though is that there's just enough extra content for players of the original game to go back and do a second playthrough of this yeah and f- feel good about spending that money and i mean just enough but however the base game was sensational and i think if you have bought the base game recently like me mm-hmm. then you shouldn't feel very bad about that in any capacity i mean i picked the original game up pretty cheap recently and i am perfectly comfortable playing through that and not playing through royal but if you're into jrpgs if you're into your pokemon if you're into final fantasy persona 5 is definitely something to check out it's definitely caught my interest for a long long time and now that i have all the time in the world (laughs) during quarantine i might finally get around to playing it at some point shout out number two sony is pulling a mario game from dreams because of a Nintendo complaint. This had come to light when a Dreams creator called Piece of Craft shared a screenshot of his Mario model within Dreams with like a banner over it saying that it had been moderated and that it had been removed for copyright infringement effectively. Um, Then Piece of Craft on Twitter again then shared an email that he'd received from SIE Europe, not even Media Molecule, (laughs) Sony, PlayStation themselves, Uh, explaining that Nintendo had in fact objected to the use of their IP in their game. And subsequently, gamesindustry.biz, and we'll put this article on the show notes at players2.com as well, have confirmed with PlayStation that this is part of a wider IP infringement notice that they had been served by Nintendo um, for the use of their content in their games and that more content that's been created in Dreams based on Nintendo properties will be removed. Mm. Quite frankly, I am shocked this is taking this long. Yeah, uh, we. I think From we all said it one, when Dreams was we coming have out. seen Mario sixty four remakes and Dreams like from day one. Yeah, I am shocked that it took this long. Absolutely, same. You know, I've seen clips of Pokemon games that have been built in Dreams. It was yeah. We all said when Dreams was first announced, even and when the through the development cycle, the big question that kept coming up was how are you ever going to stop people infringing on other game IPs' property rights? And so this was inevitable. It has taken a bit longer than I think most people would have thought, but it's well seeing that it's Nintendo who've stepped up first because they are notorious for being oh, yeah. like tight on their IP as they absolutely should be. They've got some of the most valuable IP in gaming and in media generally. So it's a it's a challenge for Dreams this, I think. I, I wonder how Sony are going to deal with it going forward. Folks, you can't you can't use other people's IP in your games. <laughs> you, you you simply can't. Yeah. That's the end of the story. I mean, I mean, it sucks for this guy who I'm sure has spent quite a long time on that Mario model because I, I don't know if you... Did you see yeah, the Mario did model? See, yeah, it, did it look looked brilliant. fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. It looked really, really good. But I, I don't know. At the same time, I feel as if Dreams is such an amazing creation tool. Don't use that amazing creativity that you've got. Don't use that amazing technical skill that that guy clearly had. Making a, a model of Mario, like make, make your own model. Yeah. Make something creative. Do something your own. Th- then I know there's like the flip side to that argument is like, well, would you have got any coverage at all if it was his own model and whatever and it wasn't just a good, well-made Mario? But I don't know. I, I just think that m- maybe this will push it a bit more towards people doing their own things and creating their own ideas and coming up with their own stuff rather than just co- copying other games because that was the that was the criticism of a lot of the media coverage of dreams yep. was just oh look at x game made in dreams now yeah uh, do you know what i mean rather than showcasing oh look at these amazing games that someone's created off their own back in dreams do you know what i mean that wasn't getting any coverage. yeah exactly so that- I, I hope that there's a bit more of a move towards that you know all right shout out number three gdc have announced a new event called summer gdc Um, which is going to be taking place on August the 4th through the 6th. GDC, of course, was one of the first casualties in the video games conference scene to be cancelled because of the coronavirus. But they made this statement on their website just last week. Taking place from August 4th to 6th, GDC Summer will be a three-day celebration of all things game development, featuring multidisciplinary educational and inspirational talks and a freestyle two-day show floor on the 5th and 6th, GDC Summer represents a unique opportunity for developers to get up to speed on advances in the field while mixing and mingling in sunny San Francisco. Don't wait until next March to drive your career and business forward. Registration for GDC Summer will be opening soon. Be sure to subscribe to GDC email newsletters to be notified first. I mean, right. To a certain extent, this is admirable. I like the foundations of GDC anyway, as a lot of game developers getting together and doing business, meeting one another, networking, having lots of face-to-face meetings, getting deals done. Do you know what I mean? I like that all that happens at GDC, and I like that GDC are still trying to provide a platform to do that. However, in the world, as it is right now, 
where me and you are stuck in our homes. I know that a lot of states in America are totally locked down as well now. And I know for a fact that California is one of them where this GDC event will be taking place. I don't know. To me, this just seems very short-sighted. If I, if I were a developer, I wouldn't be signing up for that because I would be in no way expecting it to actually go ahead. So to me, this seems a bit naive of GDC to think that that will go ahead as planned and not have to be pushed again or cancelled again. Yeah, it's, it's extremely premature. I don't think there's anything else I need to add to that. They have made this announcement under seemingly no pressure to do so. And I think that they've gone too early because America is still sort of behind Europe in terms of its response to the virus so far and its, its infection rate and stuff. So I just cannot see any world where on August 4th to 6th this is totally over and they are comfortable welcoming hundreds of people to small conference spaces. I think that this is inevitably going to be delayed. Yeah, to me this to me this is crazy. I I don't understand why they would do this. Again, as as you rightly pointed out, with no pressure to do so. I don't understand. However, speaking of GDC, they actually gave out their Game of the Year awards just last week as well. This of course being delayed because of the coronavirus again. And the winner was Lewis. Untitled Goose Game. I'm on the goose. Oh, fuck <laughs> me. Right, again, I find this somewhat unbelievable that this is now the second developer voted award that Untitled Goose Game has won Game of the Year. This and the Dice Awards, which was earlier in the year, Untitled Goose Game took, like, the crown. And I don't know, like, for me, I just don't see any justification in that. It's a great game. I'm not saying that it's not, and I would actually highly recommend that anyone listening go and play it. It's really, really fun. It's really, really good. I could not call this Game of the Year. I couldn't. I completely understand why you couldn't call it Game of the Year. I I don't think I could either. Um, as fun as it is, and as much you know, as much enjoyment as I got out of it playing it, I, I struggle to see a little bit about why developers think that this is the best game. As I, I think I said when we that, that's why I think this is so interesting. I'm kind of thinking to myself because all the developers have voted for this as Game of the Year. I'm kind of thinking to myself, what am I missing? You know? Yeah. I can see that. I mean, obviously they have knowledge that we don't have, but then we are all, you know, judging games on different criteria individually, even between the two of us. The one thing I said before when it won at the Dice Awards was, I wonder to what extent game developers and the people who work in games generally are voting for that game because it transcended gaming. Whereas pretty much every other game that won awards or didn't win awards at the GDC Awards this year, they're all games that gamers will be playing and talking about, but no one else will be. An Untitled Goose game became this kind of media phenomenon, and I wonder if there's just something that they appreciate about that. But yeah, it's hard when you look at what it was up against, and when you look at even, I mean, the rest of the category winners, I think, are really strong in some places. So for it to, to win out overall is quite a quite a statement i think but uh you know fair fair play to them certainly is certainly is all right Lewis, time for a beer or a tea in your case because <laughs> you're no longer here to pillage my beer and then we will be back with topic of the week <laughs> pillage your beer and we are back with topic of the week topic of the week this week is the ps5 versus the xbox series x spec loose we got a lot of details in the last week, both about the Xbox Series X, which we actually intentionally never spoke about last week because just as we were about to start recording last week's podcast, it was announced that Mark Cerny was going to give a talk on the PS5. Now, Mark Cerny's talk was to do with the architecture of the PS5 and he was delivering his vision for the PS5 and it was supposed to be given at GDC. I think that this was badly communicated by PlayStation about what to expect in this talk <laughs> because I think a lot of people, a lot, a lot of people... Including yourself. This to be... No, 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 no. no. I, I didn't expect this to be a reveal. A lot of people expected this to be a reveal. I expected it to be more exciting than it was. I expected to see some games running in the PlayStation 5 architecture. Yeah. However, we did not see that. And it was very, very, very geared towards developers. Would you agree with that? Oh, yeah, it seems to be, yeah. Uh, so I didn't watch the presentation live as I was intending to. You have to done because, yourself a favour, yeah, honestly. It is, <laughs> brutal, it is brutally boring. Yeah. You know what the thing is? Is that Mark Cerny has, like, the most beautiful ASMR voice I've ever heard in my life. But as a function <laughs> of that, it does have this uncanny ability to basically put you to sleep. Yeah, and to probably sound like a robot speaking at you about things that you don't understand, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, that that is also not untrue. But 
I, like, I, I don't know, like, what did you think about the, particularly the PlayStation side of this? Because Xbox basically just released this information uh, to various media sources who then wrote it up. Yeah. Whereas PlayStation had decided that they were going to give out these details in a GDC style talk, which it was very, very much aimed for developers, but they put it up on PlayStation's YouTube channel, sorry, as a live stream for hundreds of thousands of people to watch. And I think when I was watching it, the peak that I saw was over 600,000 people watched that. Mm. Oh wow, God. Yeah. And I was just thinking to myself, how many people here are just bored to tears? <laughs> and just like this is just one hundred percent just not what they thought it was. Yeah. I mean that yeah, that from a marketing perspective, happened. that can't be great, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well that's it. You don't you don't want to put people off before you've even really begun. You're totally right that it seems like it was slightly miscommunicated and that there'll be a lot of people tuning in for it. I suppose probably the reason they did that was just that the video was likely to leak anyway if it was being filmed and broadcast to, you know, privately to developers. So you might as well make it available to everyone. And everyone has some, you know, some knowledge of this or some interest in it, at least not that we quite got exactly what we thought we might have got. But yeah, so we now have specs for both consoles. We have slightly more features for the Series X still at the moment from, like you kind of suggested there, like Xbox are being a bit more freeform with how they're putting out this information, I guess. There's not, doesn't seem to be any very tight structure. It's just kind of like they'll make statements when they choose to make statements, whereas Sony are still keeping stim about a lot of things and they're still doing it in this quite, are, yeah. quite deliberate way where they only reveal information at certain points. So there's still it's a lot to learn about both consoles, but certainly a lot still to learn about PlayStation 5. Yeah, definitely. So, so just to get into the specs very, very briefly, and we're not going to overload you with a whole bunch of specs here because, quite frankly, we don't understand them. <laughs> um, yeah, but and before we go any further, like me and Lewis are 100% not the most technically minded people, particularly when it comes to memory bandwidths and things like that. But the big one, the big one really was how many teraflops have you got? Shows your flops. Shows your flops. Long story short, PlayStation 5 doesn't have as many. <laughs> <laughs> On paper, 10.28 teraflops for the PlayStation and 12 for the Xbox Series X. The PlayStation has 36 CUs running at 2.2 gigahertz. Um, and the Xbox Series X has 52 compute units running at 1.825 gigahertz. So a bit less on the frequency there, but more teraflops overall. Yep. Um, in terms of storage as well, the Xbox has one terabyte of NVMe SSD storage, whereas PlayStation has a custom 825 gigabyte SSD, so slightly less there again on PlayStation. But where PlayStation really comes alive and is really doing something, from what I can tell, quite special here as the data transfer speed or the io throughput for those of you who are technically minded and know exactly what that means um so from what i can work out that this is the speed with which you can get information off your memory onto your screens basically and for the xbox they have 2.4 gigabytes per second raw and 4.8 gigabytes per second compressed however playstation has 5.5 gigabytes per second raw which is more than Xbox's compressed speed. And compressed, they can get between eight and nine gigabytes per second. Now, from what I can tell, so we'll, we'll just start there. We'll start on the SSDs because that seems to be what will probably define this generation of consoles mm. and how that's going to change just how, how quickly everything happens. And it will no longer be tied down by normal uh, magnetic strip hard drives, do you know what I mean? Because that, in effect, was what was limiting the speed of the PlayStation 4 and the Xbox One. However, what PlayStation are doing there seems to be, like, astonishingly fast, like, ridiculously fast, to the point where they were speaking about no load times at all. Xbox and their demos showed, um, I think it was State of Decay, on an Xbox One loading up in about 30 odd seconds but on an xbox series x loading up in about i can't remember what it was i think it was like nine less than 10 we'll say yeah. less than 10 seconds but what playstation is talking about is instantaneous it's about no load times at all yeah absolutely that it seems we did see the footage before of spider-man from the ps4 yeah um, so that was leaked footage from like a was it like a stockholder event or something yeah like that? Was it, yeah they, they showed it off before basically and they and, and that kind of demonstrated how quickly like the fast travel load times could be in particular and that seems to be one of the things they're driving towards here it's all of these 
and not to say, by the way, that Xbox isn't also quick and you know will still see significant oh, it'll be very, difference very, very to, to, to the current yeah. gen. But both of these, both of these are clearly now very big steps forward. Yeah, that, ex- that, that is what I am learning is Abs- that both absolutely. of these consoles are huge steps forward. Yeah, and the, the, there's not maybe too much between them, but on the speed of the solid state drive, absolutely, Sony are killing it. They're go- going hard. I think on the philosophy of what more power and more speed from the th- the read write can do for games and gamers. I don't. I've never felt like load times are a massive inconvenience, but if what is being promised is this idea that textures will be loading instantaneously, that whole open world maps will be loading instantaneously, and there won't be any delay on that whatsoever. You won't have to go through mindless um, elevator <laughs> scenes and video no, games exactly. anymore. So, so actually, Mark Cerny himself, during his incredibly dull talk, <laughs> um, one of the more interesting things that he was saying was that uh, this could fundamentally change the way we think about game design yeah. which is very interesting to me yeah it seems like rather than just iterating and just putting on better parts in here sony on this one element alone have gone custom built is the way to go that's why it's a funny number you don't get 825 gigabyte you know ssd drives in the wild they've custom built this they've made sure that it can do what they want it to do and that will surely then feed into game design for the first parties at least it's always going to come down to lowest common denominator for third party games basically but it still might mean that you get that kind of power boost on playstation that you might not get on xbox well it's, it's interesting well i think we have to be careful with what we say there because fundamentally Xbox has more power than the PlayStation. Yeah. It does, bottom line, the Xbox is more powerful than the PlayStation. It's also interesting that I think about how they're choosing to use this power because PlayStation is choosing to use it to make the games run very, very efficiently and very, very quickly, whereas Xbox seems to be using their power a lot more to make the games look better. So, for example, like another thing that I was going to come on to talking about was ray tracing. Mm -hmm. And although both support ray tracing, I don't think that PlayStation have said anything about a hardware accelerated ray tracing, which is the which is the daddy, uh, for lack of a better term. Um, whereas Xbox do definitely support that, and a lot of their teraflops are going towards producing beautiful, beautiful images of games. And I'm not sure that PlayStation, from what they've said just now, will be capable of matching that in terms of visuals. But in terms of speed of processing. It seems to be ahead of Xbox. So what I'm kind of gathering here is that games in the future might look better on the Xbox, but might run more quickly or more efficiently, certainly, on the PlayStation. That seems to be what I'm kind of gathering. I think that might be a gross simplification of the situation. Yeah, I mean... And, and, And ultimately, as we were just saying before we just started recording this section, is that really it's far too early to tell which of these systems is going to be quotes better if there is a better they just seem to be they seem to be arriving at the same point taking different paths you know i think that's a very solid way of putting it i keep seeing essentially differences only coming up in small in small areas of this overall picture and it seems to be about you know very small decisions about the philosophy and the idea behind what each company is trying to do like you say one maybe is more focused on performance and one is maybe more focused on visuals or on power or whatever Um, so we'll see how those things pan out I think that ray tracing I think they have said that it'll be baked into the GPU in some way but I I have no clear knowledge of what any of that means Um, so I, I think it's fair to assume just based on the power details that Xbox will Will probably make a game look slightly better but I don't think from all the suggestions and everything that I've read around it that there'll be any significant difference it's probably the difference that you'll see in current gen terms like between the PS4 Pro and the Xbox One X like it, every game does look slightly better on the One X definitely but that doesn't mean that the PS5 won't be able to do the oh, same no, things of course not I'm, that, not, I'm not trying yeah. to, I'm not trying to suggest that the PS5 would be looking like bad yeah or, anything, or just or, noticeably or worse not bad but yeah yeah um, and another thing that I thought was quite interesting about all this as well was the fantastic frankly feature that the xbox has got which is this uh quick resume from Mm -hmm. multiple games i think that looks absolutely awesome i think that if playstation do a similar thing and they are promising zero load times and you can flick between four games that you're playing at any given time and lewis camley who often has (laughs) in recent in recent months anyway several games going at once i don't know i just think that's a really great feature to be able to suspend 
multiple games like that just so you can jump back in super super quickly yeah i mean i think for most gamers that's again not a massive thing they won't you probably haven't ever thought about that really before it was told to you that this was now possible but it does just open up a lot of possibilities like the idea it's, of, it's just a great feature man yeah, like, I, like i like was i crying out for it no but i think that when i have it i'll be like how did i possibly live without this yeah <laughs> you know <laughs> exactly and and it's yeah that that ability to switch between you know the multiplayer game that you're you know you're playing fortnite with your pals and they all jump offline and you can just jump immediately you know with seconds of delay back into your single player game exactly where you left it it is a thing like that on switch i do quite a lot i never sw- like shut my switch down i just it just quick resumes in the game and i've always loved that that you can within seconds of booting the switch you're back you're back exactly where you were you know you've just got it straight onto the pause screen and so to have that on games of this kind of quality that we'll be talking about for next generation it's it's really impressive stuff i think well it, like, i i do it just now with one game yeah in a rest mode on the playstation and, and xbox has a has exactly exactly the same feature as well where you can just jump back into a game immediately but that's only one game to be able to flick between games like that mm. I, I don't know to me that just sounds awesome <laughs> that sounds really really great Absolutely, i think that yeah. i think that really encourages people to play more games and in, in my head it does anyway and i think that that's what xbox is trying to do because obviously all this will be tied into their games pass as well so you could have oh what's the newest games pass game oh, i'll try that out for a little bit oh do you know what i'm not fancying that just now and all my friends have just come online we'll go and play some call of duty and yeah. then we'll oh, flick back to that again and it's just like totally switching between them there's just no hassle at all suddenly i don't know i just i just really like that yeah. and i really 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 hope that uh, playstation implement a similar system definitely yeah one, one of the kind of stranger things about Xbox was some of the decisions that they were making with regards to external or expanded storage. So have you seen these little wee weird memory card looking things? I have seen them, yeah. And I, that is one of the things that stuck out to me, the difference in approach between Sony and Xbox towards um, expanded storage because Xbox are going for a propriety, this, this memory card, whereas Sony are saying that you can essentially get off the shelf SSD expansions which yeah so 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 the xbox one is made by seagate it's made specifically for the xbox series x it will likely be rather expensive as as will as will the playstation expanded storage admittedly initially yeah but there will be playstation approved third party ssd storage that you can that you can add to your playstation however for xbox it would have to be this seagate proprietary external drive that kind of looks a wee- weirdly like an old playstation memory card I oh think. yeah 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 it does definitely I th- yeah i think that's the the interesting thing about it that will remain at a high cost surely for quite a long time there's no competition so there's no need to drop that cost whereas like you said initially is the key word solid state drive storage right now is absolutely expensive um but Partic- particularly these drives that we're talking about just now and in yeah. actual fact playstation's solid state drive so far as i understand it just now just like what we were talking about is so fast that there is no gaming pc on the market right now that can match that in terms of speed and in actual fact the type of drive that they are going to use is only just sort of coming out for pc gamers Mm -hmm. and right now those cards can't match the speed of playstation so i'm not even sure that when we launch you will be able to buy a card that is good enough to go into the playstation 5 ultimately that will come and ultimately they will surpass the 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 one that's in the playstation 5 and mark cerny actually even said that in a stage like they they, he's talking about 5.5 gigabytes per second but i think that the version of these cards can actually go up to 7 gigabytes per second yeah and playstation will be compatible with that ultimately the way that they incorporate that into their system it seems to be very very innovative and very good and they can continue to use the throughput speeds that playstation is using or at least get something close to that Mm. and there was also a whole other thing about setting priorities in terms of what you needed off the memory at any given moment i think playstation were saying that they were going to have six levels of priority whereas these cards just now only have two so so playstation will be enforcing that onto external memory as well but the fact that you can just lift something off a shelf theoretically and whack it into your PlayStation. It won't work quite like that because there's, well, there's spatial constraints yeah. for a kickoff and it will have to be approved by PlayStation that this card will go into your PlayStation 5, which is very interesting that Xbox have taken quite a radically different approach to that. 
and quite a I, I don't want to say anti-consumer I, d- <laughs> yeah. I don't want to say I don't because I, I, don't, I don't really mean that I don't really think that it is like actively anti-consumer no, but, but it's would... not a very consumer focused move yeah which is very much what Xbox have been focusing on normally doing days. yeah and external storage is one of the few things beyond the actual games that gamers can have a lot of sway over you know and might actually you know right now the idea of expanding storage on the PS4 is, is a really strong one because it's so easy to fill up and uh, yeah it's hard to argue with what Sony's doing there they're basically saying you can get anything off the shelf we're going to provide essentially a list of approved not, ones not anything to not, not anything not although anything. I, I think the messaging is a little unclear has to be approved by Playstation yeah but that doesn't mean to say that in future it won't be everything they're just saying at launch they'll have specific ones that they are approving well, or, yeah, okay, or, or that you can true. guarantee that will work you know so presumably any that Sony make or any subsidiary of Sony make will, will work and yeah it's just it might not run at the same speed as the internal one does but it's potentially another terabyte of, of storage that you can then move between the two drives that to me is a forward thinking move from sony and an unusually not forward thinking one from microsoft as you said like they yeah. usually that's normally their core thing you know maybe they will drop the prices if they have kind of sway over seagate to do that then maybe we will see them become much more affordable yeah there was just two more things that i wanted to cover as well so we've not got anything on the dualshock 5 yet playstation are definitely holding those cards tight to their chest with mm. a lot of this stuff but we have now seen the series x controller interesting that the Series X doesn't have a USB-C connection. Mm -hmm. I thought that was very interesting. So the controller itself could have a USB-C connection, but the actual tower as such for the Xbox Series X doesn't and that to me isn't a forward thinking move because right now the world is in the process of moving to USB-C yeah. I mean Apple Apple have basically been forced into going into USB-C by the European Standards Commission yeah. or someone like that but ultimately USB-C is the future and to build a console now that doesn't incorporate USB-C seems very strange to me yeah so that's all about ensuring that their peripherals from previous generations are all compatible yeah, it, it's, it would stun me if there isn't a USB-C port alongside the USB-A and B or just USB-A on the apparently, machine. Do apparently. Do we know that that isn't true? Yeah. Apparently there is not. I, wow. I'm pretty confident that I've read that, yeah. that on the unit, on the Xbox Series X box tower. Mm-hmm there is not a USB-C port, yeah. as I understand it. Yeah, that, I'm perfectly willing to be proven wrong there, but as I understand it, yeah. there is not a USB-C port. That's, it's been my understanding as well. I just thought that maybe they, you know, there was something that was being missed. But uh, yeah, that, I think that is a, it's a bad move, an actively bad move potentially that because it does leave... I mean, it's great if you've got backwards compatible peripherals, particularly their um, accessible, you know, adapted controller that they released, what, about a year but, ago? But Microsoft. to say as well, like, like we're saying that that's to ensure like backwards compatibility... And that and that's all well and good, but surely you could have had a, a standard USB port and a USB C port. Like, yeah, that's something yeah, having both. That's you know? exactly what I would have thought would happen. Yeah, or, or I mean, and they you know they obviously know what they're doing. It's a, it feels like a bit of a risk to me, um, particularly given that it's Microsoft that are building all of this and they're you know at the forefront of computing. But um, yeah, but it got to say the controller itself looks gorgeous. I think the changes that it, they've it, made it to really the does. Look it really, really, really does look really good. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, to be to be fair, I think that controller looks fucking brilliant. Yeah, it's I, I so still don't slick. like offset joysticks i will be forever in the playstation <laughs> camp that way but apart from that i think that controller looks fucking great yeah. yeah fair play to them and there's a whole other side to that controller as well about really 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 short latency as well and yeah uh, they're doing a whole bunch of stuff in that area as well which is really yeah, almost really, like really, mach- really interesting machine learning they're using to get well, around the latency, <laughs> i yeah. wasn't going to get into the machine yeah learning, but even, yes, there's it. a whole machine learning <laughs> yeah. aspect to the xbox series x as well which is, which is absolutely fascinating as well um, but the last thing that I wanted to end on, which is a PlayStation thing you will not be surprised about, um, is actually 3D audio. And Mark Cerny really went into a huge amount of detail about 3D audio and the amount of processing power that they are giving to audio. I think that he said there was something like a fraction of a core, like half a core or a quarter of a core of the current processor in the PlayStation 4 that was dedicated to audio. So that's how little processing power was given to audio and mm-hmm. the current generation and in actual fact he alluded to the fact that the cell processor on the playstation 3 actually gave more processing power yeah. to audio than the ps4 did that's right yeah. however what playstation are proposing to do now is truly astonishing i think and they are giving enough computing power that is equivalent to having a whole playstation 4 just processing the audio Good which grief. which is remarkable and it's, it's all to focus on 3d audio I'm sure on the latest uh, Dolby 
three D audio surround sound stuff that you can map something like thirty odd sources of sound that is to do with creating a presence that you are actually there and you're hearing these sounds as they would be heard by the character that you're playing whether that be in a video game or whether that be in a movie or whatever and i'm sure that they can map something like 30 ish different sound locations what playstation is proposing to do is to map hundreds of sound locations which means that as mark cerny was saying you could map individual raindrops and hear rain the way that you would hear rain in real life and it not just be like oh rain sound starts yeah. now do you know what i mean and that that is remarkable and it was all to do with what he was describing as like presence was like it was like really feeling as if you were there mm-hmm. rather than feeling as if you were hearing a simulation of what was being heard yeah if that makes sense yeah it's all about immersion there you like to put, absolutely immersion 100 percent. to put that much power towards audio which you know for a lot of gamers isn't going to be a key thing at all but the the better our and you know home audio systems get and particularly the more that we play games with uh, headphones on that is going to be an absolutely crucial thing to making you feel like you like you said there that you are in the space that you're actually stood on that street corner and you're not just watching someone standing in the rain on the street corner you know it's it's absolutely amazing as well the way that they were mapping sounds going into people's ears as mm-hmm. well and creating a profile of how literally different shapes of ears heard sound differently yeah. And that on the PlayStation 5, you might be able to select different profiles of different ears to make it sound more correct to you. Mm -hmm. And then he was also suggesting that you might even be able to send in pictures or scan somehow your own ears um, to to create a a personalized profile for you to make the sound sound even better. And as well, he wasn't just talking about it coming out of headphones, although I'm sure that is ultimately where this will start. But he was also talking about it coming out of just normal TV speakers yeah, and, and how they were going to make yeah. that work and sound bars and how it could be expanded to like five speaker or six speaker surround sound systems or whatever they're up to now. Yeah. You know, and it, it was just amazing the, the way that he was talking about it. I, I never really considered audio that much in that way, but the way that he was talking about it and the way that he was talking about how it could really immerse you in a situation. I, I thought that was, I, I thought that was really interesting, really, really fascinating. But ultimately Lewis, I think it still comes down to the games, doesn't it? I think, yeah, that's that's where the true kind of separation between these two things are. I think it's, it's really important to say, yeah, Xbox is maybe slightly edging it just now in terms of power and in terms of messaging, but until we know what games are there to play, no one should really be making any decisions about which one they're going to play. So, yeah, still lots to come, definitely. Definitely, and I'll look forward to hearing it. But in the meantime, Lewis, I'd like to remind everyone that you can find players out on all the social media. That's Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, the lot. You can also find our written content over at players2.com. That's P-L-A-Y-E-R-S-T-O-O.com. And if you could take five seconds to give us five stars wherever you get your podcasts, whether that's Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Podchaser, wherever. If you could give us five stars, that would really, really help us out. It does a huge amount for the exposure of the show. And if you leave us a little review as well and let us know, we'll give you a shout out on social media. I'd like to remind everyone that our play-along game for this month is Her Story, which I have sadly still not started (laughs) due to this being an absolutely manic week due to lockdown and many, many other things. (laughs) But now that I have a lot of time on my hands, it will definitely, definitely be getting played very soon. (laughs) And with that, ladies and gentlemen, we will see you next week. Players 2 will be continuing, as always, just from different locations. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. All right, ladies and gentlemen, until next week, we'll see you later. Bye. Bye.